All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us this evening. Um, welcome once again. Uh, as you know, every Friday we have our seminar for HS2 Academy so we can help educate the public about trends in admissions. And today we actually have a wonderful opportunity to have a, a guest speak to us about Occidental University. So our guest this evening is Mr. Duan Duan Shea who is the Senior Assistant Dean of Admission at Occidental College. Uh, and so, you know, we really, really hope that he can help enlighten everybody about some of the trends going on, specifically as it relates to Liberal Arts College, of which Occidental is one, uh, and maybe learn more about the differences between uh, Liberal Arts Colleges like Oxy and uh, research universities or larger national universities. Uh, and maybe we can uh, learn some insights in terms of the advantages of potentially attending a Liberal Arts College, okay? Um, as usual, if you have any questions, you can feel free to go ahead and type it into the Q&A box, uh, and that way we can get to them in the order that you have. Uh, of course, you can ask questions to Mr. Shea, uh, which, who's, of course, our guest speaker for tonight. Um, but if you have general questions about admissions in general, I can maybe hop in there and maybe try one or two as well if you'd like. Or if you have any questions about HS2, I'm more than happy to answer those questions. So with that, I'd like to hand over the floor to Mr. Shea. All right. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Patrick. Hello, everyone. My name is Duan Duan. I use he and pronouns. I'm a senior assistant dean of admission at Occidental College, as you can see through this aeroscape photo of our campus. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about, you know, mostly focusing on private higher education in the U.S., the differences between liberal arts and research universities, although some of the, you know, characteristics of research universities can be applied to state universities like use the UC system, for example. Um, hopefully we'll be able to answer some questions about the differences and widen your scope to, you know, all the different institutions that we have in the US so you can you know, plan for your college application process a little better. Um, just to start off, I've been working in a mission for a few years now. I worked at Pitzer College previously to Oxy. Um, for three years, and it's also a small school with about a thousand students. Um, at, and then I've started working at Oxy almost a year and a half ago. Um, and you know, I read about eight hundred applications a year. Which, if you're curious on how many essays that is, that's around sixteen hundred essays a year. Um, and so I've read a good amount of applications to confidently, you know, talk about what admission looks like in the US, what it looks like in California, specifically for private institutions. So the biggest differences, I think, starting on the wide scope, there are 5,000 universities and colleges in the US, if you didn't know that, it's a very large amount. We're very fixated as a society on you know the top 200 colleges and universities, but in reality, there are about 5,000 in the US. The first thing that if you're starting off on your college application process or your college search journey, the first thing you need to distinguish is between public or a private uh, university. Public universities are mainly funded by state governments. Um, private universities are often funded by federal and state governments as well, um, but they the majority of their finances or their operating costs comes from their own endowment or students' tuition fees. So those are the biggest distinguishers for public versus private. In terms of the types of private institutions, um, we have liberal arts colleges and research universities. Liberal arts colleges are unique to the US. Um, they only exist in the US, at least right now, um, at a large scale that we have right now. Um, we There's a big focus on for liberal arts colleges on a well-rounded education. So making sure that students are graduating with critical thinking and analytical thinking skills. You're going to have typically smaller campus, campuses with smaller students um, in, in each class. Um, there's an emphasis on undergraduate education. So most liberal arts colleges that you know will only offer undergraduates um, to join their campus. There's a lot more classroom discussion because of the small class sizes. So faculty will still be lecturing. They'll leak, you know, their topics and talk about the reading, and then they usually sit back and let the students kind of drive the conversation and go from there. And that's really that focus on that critical thinking, analytical thinking piece. Um, typically, there's no teaching assistance in these courses. Um, 
and you get more engagement with faculty. And most liberal arts colleges are residential campuses. So you're required to live on campus for at least three years. Um, some are required for four years to really you know, focus and, and take that idea that you know, education is not just in the classroom, but you can also take it outside of the classroom. What does that look like in that residential space? Versus research universities, which really focus on research. Um, and that's a big part of you know, their mission as a college is, or as a university is to have that research component. They're typically larger in their enrollment sizes and they have multiple colleges within the university. So when you're applying for a university, you're applying to a specific college within your university. Um, and a good example of you know, why that might be important to you is that if you're, let's say you apply for UCLA, um, and you want to do engineering and you apply to the engineering college. And then a couple, and then a year in, you realize, actually, I want to do biology instead. You have to then reapply for the biology college. So it's a very different approach versus a liberal arts college. It's one college with multiple departments within it. Um, most liberal arts stu students who come to liberal arts campuses, they are undeclared and you can, you know, take courses in all the different de departments. There's no uh, distinguishing factors between college, the, the college itself uh, versus universities where you have to go from one college to another. Um, you, research universities also have graduate students and PhD students. There's larger lecture classes. You know, they're typically bigger classes of 300 students, 500 students. They use teacher assistants to break down those courses. Um, there's a bigger focus on athletics and a smaller percentage of students live on campus. I obviously work for Labards College. I did not go to Oxy, uh, but I also went to Labards College as an undergraduate student. Uh, I ended up work. I've been working for two different liberal arts colleges. So I obviously have a bias in terms of what I like um, and what I prefer and what I'm looking for. Um, but it doesn't mean that liberal arts colleges aren't making a big impact. The most famous liberal arts college in the U.S. is Harvard College. Yeah, they're actually a liberal arts college. Uh, most liberal arts colleges, you know, are in you know small towns in the U.S. They typically have less than 2,500 students enrolled. Um, and there's a lot more interaction and engagement with faculty uh, who's, you know, most of their time, they're dedicated to education and not research as their primary kind of merit in terms of their job. Smaller bar colleges, this is just a fun, fun slide that I like to add in, um, but about 9% of Fortune 500 CEOs right now have graduated from private laboratory colleges. About 23% of U.S. educated Nobel laureates are are LeBarth's graduates. 27% of U.S. presidents are LeBarth's colleges graduates. Um, this avatar here for U.S. presidents looks very much like President Barack Obama, who attended Oxy, uh, Occidental College. Uh, and then about 14% of tenure Harvard Law professors are also LeBarth's graduates. So where are LeBarth's colleges located? They're mostly on uh, the East Coast. Um, liberal arts colleges were the founding you know, colleges in the U.S. And so starting in the 1700s, when they, before the U.S. was even founded, um, Labarts colleges had, were kind of the staple of you know, higher education. They were the pinnacle of higher education. And they really held on to that kind of idea of discussion and critical thinking and writing skills. Uh, but you'll see a couple kind of spread across to the West Coast as well. Um, in California, we have 11 Labarts colleges. And these are the college, LeBarts colleges in California, um, as well as private universities. So you'll see that most or all LeBarts colleges are most of LeBarts colleges in California and SoCal area. Um, the most notable ones are Occidental College and the Claremont Colleges, which is a consortium of five independent colleges. I hope that was a good kind of understanding of you know, the differences between the Bards colleges and research universities, you can, if you have questions about that, you can pop in the q and I'll be happy to kind of dive deeper into each of them, but I just wanted to kind of go through the main ideas of the Bards colleges. Now I want to talk about my institution, Occidental College. Um, it's, um, and, you know, who we are as an institution to give an example of kind of what a Bards college does and what do we do and what, what our students do from there. Um, first of all, we're located in Los Angeles, as you can see from this slide. Um, when I go back, we're actually fun facts. I love throwing fun facts. So the, 
here it's two for you. Uh, we're the second oldest institution in Southern California. We were founded before the first road was paved in LA. Um, before the first movie was shot in Hollywood, we were founded in 1887. So we've been around for the long time. Um, the longest or the oldest sports rivalry in Southern California is not USC and UCLA. It's actually Occidental College and Pomona College. Um, to understand Southern California higher education a little bit more as well, the first college that was founded was USC, the second was Oxy, and then the third was Pomona. About 30 years after we were founded, the Southern California population tripled. And so that's when USC decided to grow into the large research university that it is now to accommodate for all the students that were coming to, uh, that, were, that were looking for higher ed in LA. That's when UCLA was born as well. Um, Oxy and Pomona, we as two liberal arts institutions, we decided to stay as liberal arts colleges in our small sizes to have that kind of classroom discussion and um, residential living experiences. So that's a education kind of history side of it to understand why we have liberal arts colleges versus research, research universities. There are different education philosophies. Oxy has 2000 students, all undergraduate students. We don't have any grad students. We have students coming from 48 states. So all but including North Dakota and West Virginia, uh, about 29, country or students from 29 countries on campus and we have 36 languages that are spoken among our in first year class but also our entire school population uh, we have 48 percent students of color so we're getting really close to the majority of students of color which is something that we're constantly looking towards um, you know especially matching trying to match southern california's demographics of majority people of color uh, our first year class also include 15 percent first gen students 15% international or dual citizens coming from overseas, and also 36 languages spoken. So we will maintain those amount of languages. Uh, we're the only liberal arts college in Los Angeles City. And so that's something that we really focus on in terms of who we are as an institution. If you're looking at other liberal arts colleges in the US, you're mostly gonna find liberal arts colleges in suburban or rural areas. Um, that's kind of how Oxy distinguishes itself from our peers is that you know, if you want to be in an urban environment um, or if you want to stay on the West Coast, Occidental College is a choice for you because our students have the ability to kind of be on campus, have that liberal arts residential experience, but also hop on and off campus into LA um, and, and do research and do internships and all these things that kind of add to your whole education experience. This is where we're located in Eagle Rock. Um, you'll see our campus down here with our football field and it actually spans all the way across. There's a hiking trail in the back. It's a 260 acre um, campus. Um, you'll see that we're eight miles from downtown LA. Uh, and I know for Angelinos, we're like, we don't know what eight miles means. It means about a 30 minute car ride. Um, so there is a bus from on the road right here where you can walk from campus and you can take it that all the way to downtown LA. It's about 30 minutes. We're also on, you know, about 30 minutes from Hollywood, um, where my video is blocking. You know, we're about 45 minutes from the ocean. Uh, we're 20 minutes from Universal Studio. Um, and yes, Oxy students do get discounted tickets to Universal Studios. If you're in the Anaheim, Irvine area, we're about 45 minutes to Disneyland. So that's a good kind of idea of where we are. We're sandwiched between Glendale and Pasadena. We're also located next to York Boulevard. And York Boulevard is in Highland Park, which was rated the most hip neighborhood in the whole world. And so if you have the chance to visit our campus and visit Eagle Rock and Highland Park, you'll notice that as well, walking down York Boulevard, um, all the streets are mom and pop shops, you know, um, brick and mortar stores, all the uh, signs for the stores are hand painted. And it really adds to you know, the vibe of that community. It's not a college town, but that's where a lot of our students will head down you know, for breakfast in the morning or grab a lunch with friends. Um, it's definitely a hot spot for our students to get off campus and enjoy LA for a bit. So in terms of academic rigor, um, everyone at Oxy comes undecided. So. We don't expect you at 17, 18 year old to know what you wanna do with the rest of your life. And that's really the, the essence of a liberal arts education philosophy is that you've taken six to eight subjects from K to 12 so far. 
So how do you know which of the 44 academic areas of study that we offer at Oxy, for example, that you want to study in if you've never taken courses in those areas? And so we give you the opportunity to come to campus undeclared with everyone else, and you have until the end of your second year to declare a major. In terms of your academics, there's also, also a lot of flexibility. Uh, over your four years, you'll take about a third of your classes in your core curriculum, a third in your major, and then the last third is left intentionally blank. In terms of your core curriculum or core requirements, these are areas of study that we have identified as an institution that we want our students to take to get that breadth of knowledge, um, to, to expand their horizon and take courses in different areas. And so every Oxford student has to take you know, an arts class, a humanities class, a social science class, a natural science class, a quantitative reasoning course, which is a math requirement, uh, foreign language, for example. But we also have different other requirements, like you have to take a course that predates the 1800s. I think this is a really good example because this is how we are different from general education, for example. So if you go to the UCs, you will have general education, or if you go to you know, a university, you'll have general education where every student has to take English 101, Math 101, Science 101, for example, whatever the university decides. In terms of core requirements, how it's different is that the example with the pre-1800s where we want our students to look at the past to consider the present and the future, it's up to you in terms of what subject you wanna to take to fulfill that requirement. Right? Pre-1800 is pretty broad. You can take a biology course, a politics course, a social science course, uh, environmental science, geology. As long as the subject touches upon pre-1800s, that qualifies for that core requirement. So yes, even though a third of your classes are dictated by the core requirements, it's up to you as a student in terms of what courses you actually want to take. The only two courses that every Oxford student have to take are the first year seminars. So you take one the fall semester of your first year and another one the spring semester of your first year. These first year seminars are writing intensive courses to get you from high school writing level to college level writing. So if you look at liberal arts colleges or tour liberal arts colleges, we're gonna talk about writing and classroom discussion and research a lot, um, but you don't have to fret, you know, we'll get you there. We'll have a little bit of a hands holding to get you there. These first two seminar courses are capped at 16. So in your first year, you have a really small class with you know, your, your professor where you get to really know your peers, really get to know your faculty. There's a couple dozen topics for you to choose from every year. And they're all centered around you know, what faculty are currently researching or what they're interested in. We had a course looking at uh, music migration, for example. So musical instruments, musical melodies, musical genres that would not have existed if we didn't have this mass global migration happening over the last 50 years or so. Um, we also had a course looking at global pandemics. So tuberculosis, HIV and AIDS, COVID-19, and how they're often politicized within our societies. If neither of those interest you, we also had a course looking at DNA and how your DNA changes once you become a vampire. So there's a lot of different ways that you can engage with the first year seminars. Um, but the main idea is there is, you know, get you to writing, level for college, getting you into college and getting you ready for research and all those things and all the wonderful things that come after that. So that's your first third. The next third of courses that you take are within your major um, and you'll end that with a senior comprehensive project. Every Oxy student since 1931 has had to complete a senior comprehensive project. It's a year long intensive you know, thesis um, it, depending on your major, it can be a research paper, a presentation, a project, a performance. Uh, one of my favorite ones is that you know, if you're a music major, um, you have to record your own album. So you fully produce and record your own album by the end of the year. And that's something that you can take to apply for grad school, apply for jobs, you know, give to your parents to say thank you for paying for my education for the last four years is what I was able to come up with. Um, but it's something that you know is a pinnacle to kind of your ending of your undergraduate years. And then the last third in the in your academic journey is left intentionally blank. And our students really love having this flexibility to do whatever they want with it. So with this last third, you can do a double major. In fact, 10% of our students do a double major. 3% uh, of our students do a self-design major. 
you can do a double minor, you can do a triple minor, um, you can study abroad for longer and take courses that are not relevant to your major or the core requirements, or you can stay on campus and take a bunch of electives that you know don't add to your core requirements or your major requirements, but are something that you want to add to your education experience um, as a lifelong learner. We also have some numbers here on the right side. Uh, we have the nine to one student to faculty ratio. All of our classes are capped at 50 and 92% of our classes are less than 30 students in it. So really, you know, small class sizes where you get to engage and know your peers. Here's our academic areas of study. Uh, and we have a QR code. We'll have a few QR codes in the slide, um, but feel free to take out your phone and, and scan them and you can learn a lot more about the academic areas of study or if there's like a specific major that you're interested in, scan the QR code and you'll be able to click on the department and learn more about it. Um, but in terms of academic areas of study, our top major right now is economics. Um, and our top five or in the range of top five are computer science, psychology, biology, and English, as well as diplomacy and world affairs, which is our international relations major. So not majors that you would typically think of when you're thinking about smaller bar arts, right? That's there. We have a wide range of academic areas that students can all partake in. Um, some of the unique majors at Oxy are the ones that are gaining a lot of, uh, you know, popularity that I always love to highlight. The first one is food studies, which is on the bottom left here. And food studies is looking at the social inequities within our food system. So, for example, food deserts is a good example of that. Um, our uh, critical theory and social justice major, it, we're the only undergraduate college that offers this as a major. Um, you'll definitely not see this in Florida. Um, I'm just kidding. Um, another good example, I mentioned music earlier. We were placed on Billboard Magazine's top 20 music programs in the whole world. And so our students just got a renovation in their music uh, recording studio. They have a million dollars worth of equipment in there. Um, and I think this is a really good example of, you know, looking at smaller arts colleges versus research university. You take that music studio and you put it in a college of uh, 2,000 students versus a university of 50,000, 100,000 students with their undergrad and graduate population. And think about the chances if you want to, you know, tap into that resource, how many people you have to compete with to tap into that resource versus at a smaller arts college where most likely it will be open to you and, you know, 10 other students who are majoring that in their senior year. Uh, marine biology is also very popular. We have our own vessel on campus and they go off to the coast of Baja, California. They do their own deep diving and marine biology research there. Uh, we have our urban and environmental policy uh, major, and that's a combination of social work, environmental studies work, politics, kind of all into one major. Um, and then we also have media arts and culture, which we call MAC. Um, and media arts and culture is our film production department. So if you're thinking about film production, you know, we're a great spot from it. We're 15 minutes from Burbank, from all the recording studios. And so that's where a lot of our students would do internships. Of course, we also offer pre-law and pre-health slash pre-med. It's not a major, but it's a track that you can be on. Um, pre-med, for example, I know a lot of students are always asking about pre-med. About 10% of our students are uh, on the pre-med track. You have a pre-med advisor that will start working with you your first year at Oxy. And in fact, this past year, um, our acceptance rate into medical school was 89%, eight to nine. The national average is 20%. And so there's a big difference, you know, applying to medical school as a liberal arts college graduate versus a research university graduate. And I'll talk a, bit, a little bit more about that in a second. So I'm going to talk about undergraduate research. Um, I know I've been talking about liberal arts colleges and research universities, but just because, you know, how we're a liberal arts college does not mean that we're liberal or arts. In fact, a third of our students are STEM majors. Um, the same thing applies to research universities. Just because their name has research university in them doesn't mean that they do more research for their undergraduate population. So yes, they do more research with their graduate population, but if you really want to do research as a undergraduate student, smaller bar colleges are where it's at. 91% of our students do research before they graduate. 
Um, I talked about our marine biology department. This is the vessel. They're off the coast of Baja, California here, and they are doing their own scuba diving and their own fishing um, to collect marine biology uh, samples for their research. We have our undergraduate research center on campus. They fund 125 students to stay on campus during the summer. You develop your own thesis, you conduct your own research, and get to present at the Southern California Undergraduate Summer Research Conference. And every year, Oxy sends the most students to that conference. About 30% of the presenters are Oxy students, and that's encompassing all of Southern California. So think about all the undergraduate students in Southern California, and Oxy's having about 30% of the presenters presenting on their undergraduate research. So that's why, you know, medical schools often look favorably towards undergraduate students coming from liberal arts colleges is because our students are graduating with two research papers, three research papers under their belt already. And so once they get in medical school, they can hop into that right away. Um, and there isn't that, you know, gap or, or learning curve into medical school. We also have study abroad. That's something that we emphasize a lot. Um, about 75% of our students study abroad. Um, you mostly go your junior year. You can go for a semester. You can go for a full year. You can go for a full calendar year, um, which includes a summer term as well. We have 40 plus programs all across the world and all of your financial aid transfers. So you pay the same amount you would if you stayed on Oxy's campus and all of your credits transfer back. So you would still graduate on time. Um, you won't miss out on any of the courses. In fact, you can take courses at your study abroad location that satisfies your major requirements or your core requirements. We also have study away programs and you'll see these two photos on the right over here. The top one is our UN program. We're the only undergraduate college that has a partnership with the United Nations where we send 18 seniors to work at the United Nations full time. You work, you spend a semester there during your senior year. Um, and you are working nine to five, Monday to Friday at the United Nations. And then in, in the evening, you'll take courses with the faculty director. Um, one of our students who was in the United Nations program, uh, his boss caught in sick. And so he ended up addressing the UN floor. And so it's definitely a very intensive program. And it's great for our students who are interested in a career in international relations because you, you know, you have that experience that you can put on your resume and apply for grad school and you know, jumpstart your career pretty early on. On the bottom right, uh, we have campaign semester. Um, campaign semester is a uh, it happens every other year during an election cycle, and we send students off to swing states that are not their home states, and you get, get a campaign for a congressperson or for a senator. Uh, one of our tour guides uh, this past year campaigned for Stacey Abrams in Georgia, um, and it's a great, ex you know, great experience for any students who's thinking about a career in politics. There's a lot of learning to do in LA as well. And that's the biggest thing about Oxy is our location and being in LA. The bottom right corner here, you'll see our economics department. They go off to the port of LA in Long Beach every year, and they study the American trade system there. And if you didn't know, the port of LA is in charge of 70% of the import export business here in the US. And so it's very it's a very important for them to you know go down there and actually see it instead of just crunching numbers on their computer and not experiencing or seeing how everything works and ties together with each other. Um, top right, NASA's Jet Propulsion Learning Lab, top physics lab in the whole world. Um, and they're 10 minutes from our campus and a group of our students will do internships there every year. And I think that's the biggest thing. Not only are our classes are able to go out into um, LA, our students are also able to go out for these internship opportunities where you take classes in the morning, early afternoon, you hop off campus to do your internship and then you can still make it back for all the residential experiences and hanging out with your friends. Um, another example, our theater class, our theater department, has a class that watches a show in LA every Friday. And then the following Monday, they invite someone from that show to come and speak with the class. If you're interested in film production, for example, uh, we just had the David, uh, the David brothers on campus um, from uh, Everything Everywhere All at Once, the directors, and they came and did a screening of their film and spoke to our students uh, because the uh, director of visual effects on that film is an Oxy graduate. Um, if you're um, more into you know, animation um, or, uh, or Pixar, for example, we had the director of Turning Red 
um, and the executive producer from the movie come and speak with the cl- our students as well. Um, and that's all through, you know, our proximity to LA and our connections with our alumni network. Totally forgot, I also wanted to mention, um, I know in California specifically, a lot of students are interested in engineering. Uh, we have a three plus two engineering program where you do three years at Oxy and then two years at Columbia. Um, it's a program that you will graduate with uh, your bachelor's in engineering um, and you know get an advanced start in your career. And so that's something that students will often consider as well when they're looking at Occidental. In terms of our residential experiences, all students are required to live on campus your first three years. Um, and then about 80% of our students live on campus all four years. So it's a very residential experience. Um, th- through this experience, you really get to know your classmates. You know, you have those you know, deep discussions late at night. Um, there's a lot more activities and clubs and organizations that are planning activities and events because we have a robust residential experience where all of our students are together on campus during the school year. We also offer athletics. About 25% of our students are varsity athletes. We're division three, um, and we're part of the SCIAC conference, the Southern California Intercollegiate Athletic Conference. We play the Claremont Colleges, uh, Caltech, Cal Lutheran, University of Laverne, uh, University of Redlands, Chapman University. Um, they all compete. We all compete in the same conference. And so if athletics is something that you're interested in as well, you know, scan the QR code, reach out to the coaches and get started on that athletic recruitment process. We have about 100 clubs and organizations on campus, um, including cultural and affinity clubs, religious organizations, service clubs, academic and professional organizations. I would say out of our clubs, about a third of our uh, clubs are academic based, a third are affinity based, and then a third are athletic based. Um, athletics, for example, about 50% of our, or an additional 25% of our students are uh, participating in athletics or club ath- athletics. Um, our uh, ultimate frisbee teams, for example, the men's team made it to number 13 nationally. Uh, and the women's team made it to number 17th nationally. Um, and they both competed in Ohio for the uh, championship game um, in this past spring. So that's something that, you know, you're not, even if you're not interested in being a varsity athlete, you know, there's still a lot of robust activities on campus. Our most popular club right now is Dance Pro, Dance Production. And they have about 10% of our student population participate in it every year. It's sort of become a tradition to do it at least once before you graduate. Uh, you don't need any dance background to join dance production, uh, but it's a great kind of you know, indicator to show you know, how tightly knit the community is. Uh, when showcase happens in the spring, everyone is there, faculty, staff, students, because when you have 10% of the student population doing something, everyone knows someone who's in that production. This is where most of our graduates will go after you know graduating from Oxy. You'll see a pie chart on the left in terms of which sector they head into. Um, employers of recent graduates um, and recent graduate programs that our students head to. Um, I would say about on top of this, in terms of the graduate programs, about twenty percent of our students will pursue graduate a graduate program right after graduation. Um, but when we do a poll, you know five years from now, 10 years from now, we find that 70% of our graduates eventually end up getting their terminal degree. So right now it's just not super popular for students to uh, pursue graduate school right afterwards. There's a trend nationally, it's not just Oxy, but there's a trend to um, head into work and get some work experience right away. Uh, But we find our students are ending up getting a grad, ended up in graduate school afterwards anyways. In terms of the admission process, we're both on the common application and coalition application. We have three rounds of applications for um, first year students. Early decision one is due November 15th. Early decision two is due January 10th and regular decision is due January 10th as well. For early decision, it is binding. Um, If you apply, you can only apply to one early decision school at a time. If you're admitted, you have to enroll at that college, but it's your way of telling us that, you know, I'm super excited about Oxy. I'm very, like, I'm very dedicated, dedicated to come here. 
Uh, we fill up about 40% of our class through early decision. And the biggest differences between early decision and regular decision is the acceptance rate because we get our most passionate students in early decision and the applicant pool is a lot smaller. Our acceptance rate is actually 50%, um, whereas a regular decision is around 30 to 33%. So there's a big difference in terms of the different application rounds. So that's definitely something to think about if you're considering early um, Oxy as one of your top choices. We are SAT and ACT test optional. We moved towards a test optional policy during the pandemic. We're now permanently test optional. This past year, 70% of our applicants did not submit a test score and 70% of our admitted students did not submit a test score. So there's no correlation between you know, whether you submitted your test score and whether you got into Oxy. Um, to us, we're, we do a holistic review of your application, which means that we're looking at every single part of your application. And so testing is not a biggest part. I think a good way to describe this is if you were, you know, instead of looking at each individual tree, we look at an entire forest. And so for you, your application is a forest and now one part is gonna outweigh the other. At the end of the day for us, you know, a uh, random Saturday morning where you take your SAT or ACT is not going to tell us if you're going to be a good roommate or a good contributor in the classroom or good researcher uh, or someone who wants to do study abroad or do internships. And so it's not a big determining factor in terms of your application process. In terms of financial aid, we do meet 100% of demonstrated need, which means that whatever your family is able to contribute, the gap between that and Oxy's total cost of attendance, which for us includes tuition, room and board, transportation, medical expenses slash insurance, um, books, fees, miscellaneous costs, those are all included in your financial aid calculations. And I think this is a big kind of misconception in California specifically, where students feel that you know, I'm not going to even consider private institutions because you know my family is not able to contribute that or we're not going to receive any financial aid. 75% of our students receive financial aid um, and about 33% of our students are coming from California. Um, a good amount of, you know, oftentimes our students are receiving better financial aid than the UC systems because we're a private institution and we can decide where our money goes instead of you know, a UC or state system where they have to, you know, answer to the governor or to the, the board of regents for the UC systems. And so for us, we have a lot more flexibility in terms of helping our students re receive financial aid. Um, we also have the Cal Grant Promise. So if you're in California and you qualify for Cal Grant, you actually get your entire tuition waived, plus about ten to $15,000 in financial aid every year. We also offer Merit Aid Scholarship. There's no separate application process for Merit Aid Scholarship. Everyone who applies to Oxy is automatically considered for Merit Aid Scholarship. They range from $12,000 to $35,000 every year, renewable all four years. They're awarded at your time of your decision, so you're going to receive an acceptance letter with, from us with your financial aid package, with your you know, Merit Aid Scholarships, and it doesn't matter if you're applying early decision or regular decision, we're going to award the historical top 25% of our pool with Merit Aid Scholarships. And that's all I have to say about Oxy. Um, we have about 15 minutes left. I see we have a few questions. If you have any questions or want to learn more about specific things at Oxy, um, feel free to put it in the Q&A box and I'll try to get to all of them as possible. And yeah, I'll welcome Patrick back up. Um, all right, thank you. Have... Such wonderful information. Um, yeah. I think that really helps too, because uh, it sort of like demystifies a lot of the things that people might think about liberal arts colleges, right? So uh, yeah, I guess we already have some questions in the Q&A box. Um, so I'll have our guest, of course, take for shot at it, you know, and, yeah. you know, if I can chime in for maybe one or two, I, I certainly can. But I, you know, you're here for him today. So I do want to give him every opportunity to answer these questions. So, you know. Uh, yeah, before yeah, I please. get started, I'm just going to drop two links in the chat sure. box. Mm -hmm. um, the first one is a registration form. You know, a lot of the Bards colleges or a lot of colleges in general do track demonstrated interests. And so by filling out this form, that tells us that you were here today. Um, right. And if you end up applying, that's something that will work beneficially towards your application. Um, another link I'm going to drop is my personal um page um, and on there you'll find a lot of information about oxy 
Um, we also have a playlist on there. You can find your territory manager, so you can find the mission officer responsible for your high school. And then we on the very bottom, we have a fun Spotify playlist. Um, on the Oxy supplemental questions, one of the questions is, what song would you play to your first year roommate? Uh, it's not a part of your you know application evaluation at all, um, but that's something that we compile. Uh, we sometimes listen to the songs when we're reading your application, uh, but right before move-in day, we send out a playlist to all of our students, incoming first years, and we say, welcome to Oxy, can't wait to you know, have you on campus soon, here, here are your classmates, meet your classmates, and so this is a fun way, we just compile this playlist, um, so check that out. Uh, the first question I see is, what's the difference between liberal arts colleges and high-ranking small private universities? They seem pretty similar. Um, Patrick, do you want to take a shot or you want me to? Um, yeah, sure. Um, I, I guess the question then is, it, it, if you're talking about small private universities, I'm assuming you're talking about maybe something comparable to like the Ivies or maybe like a Stanford or something, right? Um, in terms of just relative size, I, I think you're still looking at like, my understanding is that the average liberal arts college, you're probably looking at a population of about maybe 2,000 overall undergraduates, right? Some smaller, some slightly larger. Uh, I'm not sure, um, Duan Duan, do you know like Oxy's uh, undergrad population these days, ballpark? Our entire college is 2,000 students. So in the U.S., to answer this question, mm -hmm. in the U.S., anything under 4,000 is considered small. Right. Um, anything within you know, 7,000 to 10,000 is medium-sized college, anything above 10,000. doesn't matter if you're 10,000, 50,000, 100,000, that's a large university. Right. Um, I think the question is getting at, you know, I'm trying to understand the question a little bit. Right. First Maybe of all, you I would answer up. that. All of yeah. arts colleges in the U.S. are small private colleges. Um, so oftentimes, if you're looking at ranking, for example, um, you'll see, you know, a list for, um, you know, private universities. Uh, you'll see a list for public universities. And then you'll see a list for liberal arts colleges. And the reason why these are not lumped together is because they're very different institutions in the U.S. And there's no actual way to kind of desegregate the information to, you know, view them or compare them among each other. And that's why there's three major lists in the U.S. in terms of, you know, if you're looking at rankings specifically, they're all separated out. So there's just, there's no way to kind of put them together. They're very different institutions. So I think the first thing you need to ask yourself is, you know, what kind of environment do I want to be in? How do I envision myself as a college student? Do you want to be in a class and there's no wrong answer to this. There's something for everyone. Do you want to be in a class with where you are sitting there, you know, listening to a lecture, typing notes, not participating? The faculty probably doesn't know who you are, uh, which is totally fine. Um, then for that, you probably want to go to a large university, whether private or public. Um, if you want to be in an environment where even as a first year, your, your professors know who you are, you can go to the office hours and ask them questions. And instead of, you know, a teacher assistant, um, you get really get to know your classmates, it's a residential experience, no one's commuting to campus, so everyone's living on campus, then liberal arts is something that you should probably consider adding to your list. Um, I have a great example for this. My first year in undergrad, I took a film studies course, and I walk into this course, it's a, it's a intro introductory level course, so it's at the max of 35 students. And I walk into the classroom, and the professor starts off by, this is day one of our class. And the professor starts off by naming every single student because she looked at our photos on the student roster and memorized our, all of our names. And she didn't have a list and she was just able to kind of go from there. And that's just the type of professors that are at liberal arts education or institutions. Our professors are really kind of dedicated to education and really dedicated to their students. That's I hope awesome. that answered yeah. your question. Um, just as a follow up too, because I know some people will wonder this about like, um, in terms of graduate admissions, I know Duan Duan already talked about like how the matriculation rate is significantly higher at Oxy for med school. And from my experience too, um, uh, when I was doing my grad work at Harvard, um, I interned in their grad school admissions office doing minority recruitment. And I was explicitly told when I was doing the academic rankings that 
um, students or applicants from liberal arts colleges, they're, you know, in terms of similar ranking, uh, they're viewed in the same tier. Do you know what I mean? So like if you're getting an applicant, let's say from a Bowdoin or a Swarthmore, that they would be viewed comparably in terms of the academic rigor as someone who, let's say, for instance, went to Penn or Columbia, right? So there's no perceived disadvantage because, of course, grad school admissions people are very familiar with the academic rigor in both liberal arts colleges and you know, um, national research universities. Okay. So, oh, wow. It seems like there's a lot of interest in the three, two program. So I'll let you handle that one. Uh, yeah. I I'll follow up to your kind of answer as well, that in terms of graduate schools, um, there is no difference between academic preparedness for, you know, a Labarts graduate versus a large university graduate graduate schools understand that, um, I would say the reason in recent years why this scale has tipped a little bit more towards liberal arts graduates is because our students have a lot more opportunities to do research, to do internships, um, to think critically and analytically in the classroom. And that's something that grad schools are looking for right now. Um, and so our students tend to have a better success rate because of you know these lifelong skills that they're building up as liberal arts students. Um, yeah, a lot of questions about 3-2 engineering program. Um, I talked about it briefly earlier. Uh, you can do three years at Oxy and then go on to do two years at Caltech or Columbia. But in recent years, most students are going to Columbia. It's not an Oxy thing. It's that Caltech is closing their door slightly on the 3-2 program. Uh, and so just prepare that you might probably will not get into Caltech, but you can go to Columbia instead. Um, you're going to you're not going to apply for it when you're applying to Oxy, but it's something that you're going to apply for your junior or your junior year. So you have to maintain a certain great GPA level at the college and also maintain a certain GPA level within your STEM courses. And then you have to write an application to apply for the 3-2 program. So that's something to consider as well. Um, every year, about 20 students, uh, 20 first years will indicate an interest in you know, pursuing the 3-2 program. Uh, and then by junior year, about two students will actually go. Um, and the reason for that is not because, not really because of competitiveness of 3-2 programs. Um, if you, that's something that you want to pursue and you're on the track for that, you know, most of our students are able to achieve that. Um, it's because a lot of our students come to campus and they spend two years, three years here and they decide, all of my friends are in undergrad. I'm going to graduate. Like I want to spend senior year with them graduate together, and then I'll pursue a master's afterwards. Uh, and because of our success rate with graduate programs, you know, our students don't have a problem, you know, getting into accelerated programs or getting into the master programs that they want to for engineering. Um, so yeah, I think there's a lot of questions around this as well. And a good example for this is actually from Google, where they talked about how, you know, if you have a room full of engineers, um, you're not going to be very innovative in your thinking. And so if you have a, you know, and they're doing this pretty often now, especially for job searches as well. We have a room of engineers and then you throw in a Labarts graduate who, you know, has understanding of engineering or has understanding of computer science, but has also taken philosophy courses and psychology courses and art history courses. Now they're adding a lot more ideas into this room and can help the company grow a lot more. And so that's a good example of kind of, the, the education or the philosophy behind the boards. Um, oh yeah, I can, I'll be happy to share the graduation distribution. Yes, this one, I'll leave that up for you. Um, the six year ABJD program with Columbia. Yeah, another great program with Columbia. Um, you do four years at Oxy and then you do, it's actually five years. Um, you do another year at Columbia for pre-law. So if you're thinking about that, that's something that you can kind of get started with. You'll graduate with two bachelors, but then it will be on track for a faster master's. Um, that's, don't quote me on that. That's what I believe to be so. If you're interested in that, definitely check out our website and dive deeper into the pre-law program. I try to remember everything about the college, but I can't. Um, for application from families that do not have financial hardship, are they considered for scholarship? Yes, everyone is considered for scholarship. Merit aid scholarship is not based off your ability to pay, um, but it's based off of your academic rigor. 
So we're going to look at your transcript. We're going to look at whether or not you know, you've had an upward trend in your grades or an upward trend in your rigor. Are you taking more and more challenging courses year to year? How do you look at how how does your academic compare within your school system? Um, and how do you compare, you know, within the pool? And that's how we determine merit aid scholarship for athletic scholarship, uh, sorry, academic scholarships. Uh, but we also have scholarships for uh, students that have a great impact in their community, because that's something that we really, as part of our mission, is building a community, a strong community. So if you are impactful in your community, if you demonstrated that, you can also be qualified qualify for the community impact scholarship. Uh, let's see. Mentioned students must live in dorms for at least three years. Are the dorms co-ed? And would my daughter be put in a situation to have a biological man as her roommate? No, you will not be in a room with someone that you're not comfortable with. Uh, we have gender neutral housing, gender neutral uh, floors, uh, but we also have um, segregated gender floors. And so it's when you're applying or when you are coming in as a first year, you'll fill out your form in terms of what you want or prefer as a roommate. And you will have that opportunity to, you know, get to know your roommate and be put in the area that you're comfortable with. When talking about or checking demonstrated interest, do you count the number of emails from students to admission office? Um, no, we do not. <laughs> we do not count the number of emails they email us. Um, but I would say that you know because we have a you know, small class size, you know, we tend to get to know our applicants really well, especially those that build a relationship with us. So we visit high schools um, where I'm about to spend the next eight weeks just traveling around the country and the world, um, visiting high schools. And that's a great opportunity for you to connect with us. And that all counts towards demonstrated interest if we are coming to your high school and you come and visit us. Um, but you can also email us and you know ask us questions that are not answers that you can find on our website. Um, but you know, good emails, strong emails that you know show that you're interested in Oxy or the college that you're interested in. Um, and you just want to kind of learn more from the admission officer in terms of, you know, what that opportunity may look like. Um, yeah. Pre-med track. Uh, to know more about that, um, I would really recommend that you also check out the pre-med advisor web page um, since you have a more specific question about psychiatry. Um, I can tell you that you know ten percent of our students are on the pre med track. Um, it's a very successful program with our eighty nine percent acceptance rate to medical school. Uh, we have a dedicated advisor. She's a staff member that is doing full time pre med advising for all of our students. You start your first year and you work your way up. She'll advise you on kind of what courses to take, what research opportunities to look out for, what internships to do to really strengthen your medical school acceptance rate. Uh, or application. Um, this person's child has Asperger's and how would that affect the application process for student life on our campus or on our college? Yeah, so you can talk about, we do a holistic review. So you, we consider every aspect of you, not just as a student, but as a person. And so that's definitely something that we will note and we actually track that in our office. Um, when, so when you step foot onto campus, the relevant offices like the Student Life Office and the, the Office of Disability Services, they will know that your child is needs a special, uh, you know, uh, special lookout for. Um, it's not like high school, we're not gonna be as hands-on, but we are gonna pay attention and kind of make sure that your student is able to succeed in college. So that's another beneficial, you know, part of a small residential community is that we all kind of keep an eye out for each other. What is the average college GPA for all students? I do not know. Uh, we do not track the average GPA of our students um, since it really varies from you know student to student. I would say you can't be too low or you will get kicked out of the college. <laughs> uh, three, two program admission is not guaranteed. And that's not up to us. It's up to the institutions that will take you for the remaining two years. For the 3-2 program, if students studies computer science at Occident, next two years cannot be computer science anymore. 
Uh, the three two program is engineering specifically. So you would do three years at Oxy with a combination of computer science and physics, and then you'll do two years to get you know your engineering degree. If you want to do computer science for grad school, I would say do four years of computer science at Oxy, do that senior comprehensive project and apply for grad school with your senior comprehensive project. You'll have a much better kind of result from there. Why does Columbia partner with Occidental specifically for the law program? Does it commonly do so with LeBarge colleges? Yes, Columbia has a lot of three, two, four, one, four, two programs. Um, that they partner with a lot of liberal arts colleges around the country, and Oxy is just one of them. What is a gender neutral floor? Yeah, a gender neutral floor means that in the residential hall, uh, the bathroom is gender neutral. Um, students choose to live there, so you're not going to be placed there if that's not something that you're comfortable with. Um, but they're for students that identify as non binary or gender neutral. All right, uh, that's right on the dot. Thank you so much. You know, I don't want to necessarily have our um, our guest here answer any more questions just because we, he's been so gracious with his time. Um, so once again, thank you so much uh, for joining us in the seminar. Um, if you have any other questions specifically about college counseling, you know, please feel free to visit HS2's website. Um, you know, we do have the seminar every Friday, so, you know, you can join us again next Friday if you have other questions dealing with college admissions trends at large. But, of course, you know, um, Mr. Shea had already given us his contact information or the uh, the form. So, I mean, especially if uh, Oxy is one of the schools you're thinking of, hey, guys, this is a great way for you to get that demonstrated interest checkbox. So please go ahead and take advantage of that. All right. Yeah. So, yes. So for the audience, thank you so much for joining us. And Duan Duan, really appreciate. Thanks so much for educating us about Oxy and about liberal arts colleges in general. I'm glad. Thanks, All everyone. Right. Thanks, everyone. Have a great weekend. Bye.